though its aspiration sounds aloud in poetry, where Africa finds itself in this present day flashes back to 50 years of an enduring quest of breaking down the chains of colonialism evolving through democracies and developments. What a time to look back at the dreams of Africa's founding fathers that Africa can only live to its full potentials if Africa stands liberated and united. Welcome to Network Africa. I'm Ginga Ashiru. The African Charter for Democracy and Good Governance captures the drive to preserve democratic culture amongst African nations. But with just 20 countries ratifying this charter, the finish line is still far. We talk about three stages. We have the signing, we have the ratification, and um, currently, uh, to update your record, uh, we have 20 countries with Sudan about two weeks ago joining the club of uh, member states that have uh, ratified the charter. Um, um, uh, so this is, it, it's improving, but uh, we are doing all we could to accelerate it. And uh, now when I find myself uh, in the member states for one activity or the other, I also see the opportunity to discuss the issue of this ratification because it's a very beautiful charter. Um, internationally, it is respected and uh, recognized. And um, whatever we do for us to have stability and development, we must ensure that uh, we have good governance. I believe that, yes, the Pan-African Parliament has a major role to play in ensuring poverty reduction on our continent, to reduce the suffering of African people. And we think that the key to it is governance. And that is why we have at the Parliament tackled issues of governance. We're convinced that if we can have transparent and accountable government in member states, then they will be able to utilize Africa's abundant resources to manage the resource utilization and application in a manner that it will benefit majority of our long-suffering citizens. High expectations, but the reality seems shrouded in despair with sub-Saharan Africa's depressing statistics on the Millennium Development Goal Score Sheet. It's six billion lives at risk of facing abject poverty come 2015. A clearing call for a redemption mission was a more acceptable lifeline. Presently, we are working with the UNDP as regards the um, Millennium Development Goal Acceleration Framework. So we have their support technically. I'm not talking about financial support now. Technically, we have their support. So everything is geared towards our achieving the uh, MDGs. And even the international bodies are into water sanitation, which is also geared towards our achieving the MDGs. So there's quite a lot of international support in our achieving the MDGs. Who are wallowing in poverty, hunger, and disease. It is the issue that has brought to fore our consistent support for the African Charter on democracy, elections, and governance. Because we think that if there is good governance, if there is proper management and utilization of available resources, we can lift a larger population of our people from poverty. From a typical candlelight dinner was a banquet that set the stage for a campaign for a Pan-African and African Renaissance. The Pan-African Parliament is one of the symbols of the integration of our continent. And in the early years when the leaders of our continent talked about African unity, it meant that we wanted to bring this continent together in terms of integration, in terms of legislation, in terms of executive uh, power, and all that. Unfortunately, there were difficulties that made it never happen. Since then, we have tried to work to continue to achieve the integration project. Within the legal instrument entails more than stating what was contained in Article 8.1 of the protocol that called for an oversight and full legislative powers for the Pan-African Parliament. 
the leadership of the Pan-African Parliament had embarked on intensive advocacy missions to drive this solidarity campaign. Was the task of ensuring the Pan-African Parliament becomes a true assembly of African people as easy? At this crucial moment in Africa's development, the importance of a continental legislative forum such as the Pan-African Parliament cannot be overemphasized. Since the coming in of this new bureau um, being headed by Nigeria's very own Bertel Amadi as the president, he has brought um, with him into the new job a very um, a high vigor and a very urgent need to address the issues particularly on legislative powers of the African Parliament. And um, he's been having huge successes. I would know because I'm particularly close to him. I, was, um, I led the campaign team for his presidential election and um, we've been um, keeping, keeping him on his toes as to the promises we made to the members here that um, we shall in his time, God willing, make sure that um, the protocol of the African Parliament is ratified. He was clear, he was precise, that the time has come to endow the Pan-African Parliament with additional functions and responsibilities to enable it to achieve its mandate. We believe that the mandate of the Pan-African Parliament is clear. And it requires additional functions and, 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 and uh, this will help us because you see we have a mandate to speak for the people of Africa to represent the people of Africa to be a platform for African people and their grassroots organizations to make an input into the decision making process of the African Union in finding solutions to the problems facing our continent the Pan-African Parliament no doubt has a lot to contend with in weathering the storms from a different standpoint, was a robust dialogue of where Africa should be in the next 50 years. We are going to celebrate 50 years of the existence of AU, of AOU, of AU. What, what, how is that going to participate? The Media Freedom Bill was unanimously adopted as vital in the campaign against violation of human rights in Africa. And these turned out to be the Midrand Declaration. This important organ to which you belong is a continent-wide collection of the representatives of Africa's lawmakers. Press freedom cannot be realized without the support of parliaments and governments, which make rules impacting on freedom of expression and its corollaries of press freedom and freedom of information. Just as freedom of expression needs parliaments to expand and protect it, so too do your institutions need freedom of expression as a condition of your democratic function. The Commission is aware of the importance of freedom of information and has, at the last uh, session that concluded in April, adopted a model law on freedom of information to assist it in developing their, their model law, which sets out safeguards, which sets out conditions under which um, freedom of information may be derogated from. Now, the easiest uh, method for states uh, to abuse the freedom of expression is to, is to indicate that there are certain security risks or secretive, uh, the secret um, information. But that, again, the African Commission is on top and, and continues to insist that there are, uh, that the, such secret information should only have a, a great overriding security implication. As days rolled by, it was clear that Nigeria needs to strengthen its role in the global frontier by getting the African Union endorsement of the UN Security Council if it was to champion the cause for African integration.
boosting power play from conference diplomacy was not such an easy nut to crack. In the days to come, all road leads to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with each nation in a frantic bid to project their national interest, as more of these deliberations inevitably fell on these lines. In spite of all these constraints, Nigeria's team of diplomats, led by Nigeria's Foreign Affairs Minister, Ambassador Olubenga Ashu, won the African Union endorsement for the UN Security Council seats. In the last two years, we have secured for Nigeria and Nigerians 14 positions in various international organizations. That is a very high number by any standard. There is no time since our independence that we achieve this type of performance of having 14 international positions. I mean, look, we have to be fair. Other countries too must also have some posts. And don't forget that it is also enshrined in the principles of even the AU that all these posts should be shared among the various geographical groups within the organization. So don't forget, Nigeria must not be seen also as if we want to take all the posts. It's not a good policy. So where concession is necessary, you make concession. But don't forget the price of sitting in the Security Council for any country is a golden price. As far as I know, what we have just achieved, uh, only one other country in recent times has returned to the Security Council after sitting out of that council for only two years. The reason being by its own charter, elected members of the council are not eligible for immediate return to the council. You must sit as we did two years out of the council before you can go back in. So for Nigeria to have left the council in 2011 and is looking good to go back in 2014, this is a record. But the question of whether we are paying too much, I wouldn't say we are paying too much because it is not that you are paying to start with. The seat that Nigeria will be occupying has been zoned to West Africa. It is an ECOWAS seat. So a non-ECOWAS country will not take that seat. So if you ask me, the main competition and the main hurdle will be the endorsement of your sub-region, which is ECOWAS. Nigeria got that in February. And only Yesterday, the AU at the level of the Executive Council gave its blessing, being that ECOWAS had already endorsed Nigeria. From here, the journey takes us to New York in October, when the General Assembly will elect the new members. But once Nigeria has been endorsed by ECOWAS and Africa, the the hurdle to overcome is to secure a two-third majority, which will work out, I think, uh, up to 120 votes. In 2009, when we contested, we got, got the highest number of votes of the elected countries that year. And also at that time, it was a record because no African country had secured that level of endorsement. We got 186 votes for Nigeria out of 192. Tensions from issues of nationality continue to play loud with attack on a British soldier by certain Michael Adeboali for a man who has no record of living in Nigeria. The federal government of Nigeria called on the international community to join in curbing terrorism. Well, I'm in touch with our High Commissioner in London and... Um, what we are sure of is that um, those lunatics are British citizens and we believe that um, what they've done is uh, really a very heinous crime and that um, every effort should be made 
to ensure that they face the British justice. What they did is condemnable and it's uh, totally barbaric. Nigeria is not involved in this matter. These are criminals who are caught red handed, you know, with what they did on the streets of London. They have to be, you know, made to face the law according to the British legal system. I mean, they must be punished because uh, what they've done is uh, really a crime against humanity. Nobody in his right senses would have done that. Those criminals belong to the animal kingdom. They shouldn't um, really have been uh, brought into the f place where they'll be able to mix with uh, you know, law-abiding human uh, beings. Top on the agenda of African leaders was a wave of conflict ravaging the African nation. And this turned out to be the Addis Ababa declaration that Africa in the next 50 years should be silent on guns but loud on economic development. Resonated across all statements. And that's what we've been talking about. When even you talk of the African Renaissance, what is this all about? Is that 50 years we focused on political independence. That was the message all across with many presidents who are present there today. But that henceforth now, the next 50 years should be on development. Economic integration, human development, job creation, poverty reduction, development in terms of having children go to school, access to good education, to health care, maternal care. That's what we are talking about. That's what the Renaissance is all about. So that you can have a difference in your life. And that is why democracy is good. So that you can promise people what you will deliver and you will be judged at the end of the day by what you are able to deliver to the ordinary people in the country. We met with the president of Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, with the Republic, Togo and Ghana uh, to look at development on the lagos Abidjan corridor. And our report was presented to the Committee of Heads of State and uh, they have considered the report and uh, there are key decisions that have been taken. They have approved that the steering committee under the leadership of Nigeria be set up uh, to effectively drive the realization of the project. We have agreed that it's going to be a sizzling superhighway from Lagos to Abidjan and uh, the legal framework uh, for the corridor we, we have to be established that has also been approved. And of course, the issue of uh, updated studies for the corridor was also approved. And uh, due to a detailed feasibility study and preliminary design will be in the office immediately uh, so that uh, we can kickstart the construction phase of the project. The need to think out an African solution to African problems informs the need to re examine political pills such as the African Peer Review Mechanism. Many observers have criticized the APRF as the African leader's fraternity for not taking strong measures against capital flight and corruption. Under corporate gov governance, there is a concern about the enforcement of ethics and uh, enforcement of international and regional um, standards and codes, uh, treaties and conventions that have to do with corruption. There's the African Union uh, Treaty on, Against Corruption. There's an international one. We put lots of time in the review process on how those treaties are being observed, whether they have even been ratified and if they are ratified, whether they have been domesticated and have become part of the, the local laws. And if not so, we urge. We go back in the report and we write it that these are things that need to be done. And in the meeting with the, with the Forum of Heads of State, those issues are put on the table. So when they come back next time, they are asked, now have you ratified? Have you made some progress in these areas where you had some 
the, for, the first and most important thing to, to, to talk about is the need for NEPAD as an institution of government uh, that is deriving its life from a continental charter, which is an agreement by all member states of the African Union. The need for this uh, agreement to be legally domesticated. In other words, an agreement was reached by uh, all countries of Africa, of which Nigeria is a key player, and NEPAD came into life. But in Nigeria, we operate on the basis of laws. Uh, institutions like NEPAD, with all the paraphernalia, needed a parliamentarian, I mean, a, a parliamentary uh, uh, act that brings it to life, that gives it a legal status, as it were, and provides statutes that defines its privileges and all the works, including budgeting. I think this is what uh, we, we thought about in the, in the committee in the Senate, and this, um, this bill was prepared, and it has been debated. It has gone through second reading. Uh, I will imagine that in coming weeks, this will lead to some public hearing in case there are people and stakeholders who want to make contributions or amendments into that law. And we hope this should be passed any moment from now. This law, when passed, uh, brings Nigeria at par with other founding members of NEPAD that have already domesticated the laws in their respective countries and then giving NEPAD a full life of its own and it becomes a legal entity that can operate without any encumbrances, whether government go or, or, or in out of, of office. So it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge document that defines you know, the, the roles of NEPAD, its functions, its governance structures, and the limits of what every organ of the institution can, can, can carry out. It has a governance structure, it has management structures, all of which are defined within this law. So a clause-by-clause -clause, uh, debate of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the bill is what the public hearing is supposed to afford the public to make contributions into and then the, the committee brings it back to the floor of the Senate for an approval. And if you were in, in the Senate when the, the, the bill was being discussed, you, it was unanimously you know, adopted as something that is helpful to Nigeria. It promotes development, it promotes cooperation, it promotes exchanges uh, among all African nations, and Nigeria should not be an exception in this case. Well, at least since the APRM came into being, more African countries are having elections than before the APRM. So if for that alone, you know, and for the fact that the African Union adopted a charter on democracy and elections, then I think that we've made some forward uh, movement. If it's become, you know, uh, a, a, a conference or discussion of heads of state, then it's because the movement that it was required to make had, has been made. Um, I think that by being peer-reviewed, when it started, there were just a few countries that had accepted. Today, almost every African country has joined the peer review mechanism. And every four years, every five years, every six years, elections are taking place. Civil society organizations are getting stronger. The media in Africa is getting stronger. I mean, Nigeria channels, uh, TV, I mean, you're one of the, on the forefront, on the cutting edge of uh, television broadcasting in Africa. And you're not concentrated only in Nigeria. I mean, in Ghana, we can receive channels on DSTV and across the whole of the African continent. That is definitely an improvement. I think that Africa is embarked on a certain path that there's no turning back. What we need to do is to ensure that we accelerate what is happening in order to keep pace with the population growth that we're experiencing. Soon Africa is going to be the most populous continent. We're going to overtake China. And what it means is that we're going to have a huge labor force. Now, how to translate the growth that we're seeing in the economy into jobs is what the challenge for us leaders uh, would be. 
And so we need to create more jobs. We need to make sure that investors don't come and just take money out of Africa and take it away. And that when they come and invest, it must be a win-win. And that some of the profits remain here and they take some of the profits away. That's for us, is a challenge. Where would Africa be in the next 50 years raises a loud call for African leaders. The stakes are high. As the market destination and the raw material base, the future is here and now.